apologize in advance for the slide backgrounds. I uh, hope that they're somewhat enjoyable. Um, to my right is Mattias McLaughlin, an engineering manager at X Matters. And to my left, Tobias Duncron, our senior VP of engineering. And we are uh, attached at the hip on this uh, DevOps journey that we've been on. So uh, what we'd like to talk about today is uh, more around organizational change uh, in regards to uh, adoption of DevOps. Um, there's a lot of technical aspects to that, of course, and I, uh, there's a lot of the talks are covering that. But we're going to try and focus on some of the, uh, the people problems uh, surrounding that, uh, which we found to be at least as hard as the technical hurdles we had to overcome. So uh, just to set the stage, uh, I want to talk about where we came from. So let's say let's set the stage at about uh, 2015. Uh, X Matters was hosted in co-location. Uh, we ran OpenStack to try and automate as much as possible of, of that infrastructure work. Of course, we were still purchasing, racking, and stacking servers, et cetera, in six data centers uh, across the globe. So a lot of hands-on effort went into uh, our, our own infrastructure. And uh, we got to the end of a quarter, and we had a lot of orders to fill. That's a good problem to have. We always hope to have that problem. Um, in this particular case, uh, it was well beyond what we anticipated. And that was a big problem, because uh, for each customer, we had, we had to provision uh, new infrastructure. And we got a lot closer to uh, full than we ever wanted to be. Uh, in addition to that, we had some economic problems. Uh, we had to provision a lot of hardware uh, for the purposes of redundancy to provide the level of uptime uh, that we wanted to uh, provide for our customers. We also had some uh, optional services uh, that required infrastructure that were pay to play. And similarly, it was difficult for us to uh, project the demand for those services. So we had a lot of uh, idle hardware sitting around. Uh, in addition to that, more on the, on the financial side, we had very inflexible lease schedules uh, for that hardware. And it made the most economic sense, actually, to buy the latest and greatest hardware each time we made a purchase, which led to uh, a very inconsistent or non-uniform uh, set of uh, infrastructure. So depending on where we were running a particular service, um, we would get, uh, it was very difficult to anticipate what performance would be. So. Lots of problems to solve on the business side. And uh, I hand it over to Matt to talk about uh, how he would propose to solve those problems. Well, I mean, the first and, and most obvious thing that we need to address, if we have a, a capacity issue that we need to deal with, we need to look at doing things a little bit differently. And that specifically, I mean, looking at an external partner to deal with our hardware needs. If we have to sort of press a button to make more capacity exist, that really doesn't work with our, our, us running the gear and us spending you know, three months waiting for gear to arrive and then dealing with people in the middle of the night so we could get everything racked and stacked and cabled. So that absolutely means that we need to look at using a different service. And, and along with that, we were also burning a lot of calories running our own data centers. This meant you know, operations engineers that were up in the middle of the night dealing with mundane things like failed hard drives or, or bad network cards. But what it really meant is, is that you know, we were spending all this time dealing with little stuff rather than freeing up our ops people so that they could focus on, on the really important things, like you know, improving our CICD pipelines or, or just improving our overall tooling. The next obvious thing that we needed to do to solve the problem is, uh, is to really seriously cut down on the number of VMs that we had. We were in a case where every single time we, were, we had a new customer come on board, we had to spin up you know, a dozen new hosts just to support that customer. And I think everyone here can agree that that really doesn't scale. So for us, we had to look at you know, changing our, our mindset from VMs to something that maybe ran a little bit leaner. So in this case, looking at Docker and Kubernetes so that we could you know, really maximize the, the efficiency of the, the host that we had. And then, of course, we needed to take a lot of our services and revise them so that they were able to handle multi-tenant loads so that you know, as we brought new customers on, it was fine. We would just have a horizontally scaling service, and we could just throw more, more requests at it. And finally, you know, I, I mentioned before our operations team was quite busy and also you know, that we needed to expand into different services. 
Well, I mean, the, the downside of this is it led to a case where we had people who were responsible for keeping this stuff up that needed to know a lot about a lot of things in order to keep it running. And to be honest, it just wasn't sustainable. It's really hard to keep on top of you know, a dozen different services that are all running and all have their own bespoke problems. So to that end, we really needed to look at taking some of the operational costs, some of the, um, the effort that was going into keeping this stuff running all the time, and moving it into the development teams. So I thought that was a great idea because it also solves some of the uh, software development issues that we were having. Uh, we, up until this point, we had a policy of you can work on any part of the code. Uh, you're expected to get up to speed on any aspect to implement a feature or uh, fix a bug. Uh, but that, was, that strategy was reaching its breaking point. So we needed, a, we needed to divide and conquer. So uh, what we decided to do was um, break our monolith up into microservices. And um, just as a, to give you a sense of scale, that ended up being about 21 microservices uh, that we wrote, and then about 18 microservices that uh, were third-party tools. Um, we wanted to take advantage of the fact that these teams would become subject matter experts on their particular microservices so they could write features and fix bugs faster. Um, we also wanted to take advantage of uh, independently deploying these services so that when we made a change, we didn't have to redeploy the whole world. Uh, and what that would take is moving a bunch of responsibilities onto teams that they may or may not be used to or interested in, such as uh, implementing their own monitoring that's specific to their service, um, implementing alerting as well, and providing an on-call schedule uh, to support their service 24-7. And at that point, look at uh, transferring the responsibility of capacity planning and actually managing a budget for that particular service uh, was to become uh, the team's responsibility. So quite a, quite a load uh, for our development teams to take on. So this led us to our, our foolproof three-pillar plan that we were going to implement. Uh, first off was we had to break apart our, our monolithic services. Uh, we simply could not have one mushrooming service that just was doing everything. We really needed to break things apart into microservices. This was a road that we were already headed down, but we really needed to double down on those efforts. Next, we wanted to move un properly into the cloud. I, I say properly here, I mean many of you know OpenStack is cloud technology. But to be frank, the way that we were using it was really not that cloud friendly. Uh, to be honest, I, I think I could say that we were doing it wrong. So we really needed to take a look at, at the best practices for operating in a cloud environment and really, really change what we were doing. And finally, we needed to fully embrace the DevOps model. Um, we, like a lot of companies, had claimed to be doing DevOps before this. Uh, but the reality was, we, in order for us to be successful, we really did have to to move this load over to teams so that they were responsible not only for you know, coming up with the initial design and doing feature implementation, but also dealing with that operational cost of keeping services up and running. So as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, there are a lot of technical aspects to uh, this particular uh, project. But what I'd like to talk about is some of the things that went wrong on the organization side specifically. So we had this great. Uh, three-pillar plan, could not fail. Um, but it turns out that uh, some employees are just not on board. And when you're moving from uh, you know, a monolith where you have a lot of experts that have been working on the code for a long time, um, they might not be into uh, being on call for microservices or taking on operational responsibilities. So uh, the first order of business was to make sure that all of our teams had some operational uh, expertise. And those folks came from the, previously, uh, the previous operations team. So that helped a lot. Uh, and then even at that point, uh, there, you know, some teams weren't necessarily on board with uh, that, that level of responsibility. Uh, of course, in the you know, couple of years prior to this, we had made, made sure that all of our new hires uh, had the right expectations in terms of uh, the level of responsibility that they would have for microservices. And so we had a very good pool overall um, of folks that were w ready, willing, and able to do this, uh, but they may not have been on the right team. So swapping team members to make sure that each team has a good mix of uh, you know, talents and skill sets and willingness. Um, 
as we broke out these microservices again, according to uh, the subject matter expertise of the previous teams, uh, we ended up with a very un uh, uneven distribution of these uh, services. So uh, at this point, uh, we needed to look at distributing those services so that it was a, a fair and even distribution and no one particular team got overloaded. That's a tricky thing to do because no one wants to, no one likes anyone else's code. No one wants to inherit uh, a service that they didn't write. Uh, but with uh, providing sufficient time to do that transfer and training, uh, that is something that is possible to do. Compensation, always a thorny issue. So we started out with a group of volunteer first responders. Again, they were uh, familiar with a, a broad area of the product and they could handle most issues. Moving that onto teams uh, broke our compensation model for, for those first responders. So ultimately, the solution for that uh, was to assign the responsibility of assigning um, or, or allocating compensation to the team itself. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And finally, this is a problem we haven't uh, solved to, uh, we haven't sufficiently solved yet, which is service dependencies and making sure that you're not alerted for a problem with this that's not your service. So having some core service go down, in our case, might be Postgres that a lot of services depend on, uh, generate spurious alerts for those teams that depend on that service. So that is quite a tricky problem to solve. Uh, if any of you have the solution, um, see me after, let me know what it is, and I'll pay you any amount of money. <laughs> Good? Yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> so uh, on that same note, you know, it's uh, really the, the page out problem was kind of a non-trivial problem for us to address. And, and really, this was pretty significant for us to get our development teams on board with the notion that, that they might be woken up in the middle of the night should something go wrong. So really, what we had to do was we had to, you know, look at how we could get teams really invested in this model. So as Tobias mentioned, you know, we changed our HR model. So for the course of a year and a half leading up to this, we made sure that every new hire was comfortable with the notion that they would be going on call. And for those teams that, or those member, team members that, that predated this change, we really kind of had to build and instill some kind of pride. Uh, one thing that, that we definitely found is that you know, even people who were really reluctant to getting paged in the middle of the night would suddenly be on board if it meant that, you know, it was their stuff and, and they were working on it, they built it, and, you know, they, if it went down, then that was kind of on them. So really, kind of what we had to do was, was make sure that everything was, uh, the, the folks were fully invested in what they were working on. So that, that kind of on-call problem really kind of extended beyond our development teams, actually. Um, we did have to make some changes in the operations space. Uh, as, uh, as we mentioned, you know, we were taking our, our ops team and we were looking at moving them, breaking them apart so that we could create fully cross-functional development teams with front-end, back-end, QA, and operations people on the team. Which, of course, meant you know, our core ops team had a reduction both in size and in responsibility. This meant, uh, you know, the team that was responsible, that used to be kind of the, the heroes in the middle of the night, suddenly dwindled to a very small team. And we saw some successes and, and some drawbacks with that. You know, notably, we saw a number of operators that, that once they didn't have to focus on, you know, keeping a dozen services up and, you know, having to know about everything, once they were able to focus on one particular service, they really started to shine and bring some new ideas to the fore. And we, we saw some real success stories that way. Though that said, we also did have some, some not so successful events happen. Uh, prior to this change, you know, we did have a pretty high operational cost for keeping all our stuff up and running. And there were some folks who, frankly, were sick of the, the page out burden, and they weren't really on board with either moving to a new team or, or dealing with a, a, a team that was dwindling in importance. Um, Really, we just kind of had to say, like, that's okay. You know, not everybody is going to be on board with this. And really, we do kind of have to work through this. That wasn't the only issue that, that plagued our operations team, though. Uh, we also embarked, when we, we first started on this OpenStack road, uh, we looked at implementing our own frameworks for everything. We'd, we'd read all the blogs. We knew how it was done. We'd seen talks. We could do this. And really, what we ended up doing is kind of implementing something that, that I refer to here, you may have heard this term before, the inner platform effect, where you take a given language and you try and re-implement it to make it simpler, and really all you end up with is just a crappy version of that original language. So 
we were burdened with a really high cost in dealing with this framework. And not only was it a high cost in keeping this framework running, keeping it useful, it also meant that there was an extremely high barrier to entry for our engineering team. So that just pushed even more burden onto our ops staff because the engineers weren't interested in learning this new language. It was completely bespoke to us. So really, we were just kind of a little bit hooped there. And because this team was so busy, because they were you know, putting out fires, they were you know, trying to keep this framework alive, it really meant that they didn't have any time to really listen to what their engineers were saying. So if people were saying, hey, you know, you've built this thing using Python and Puppet, and it's, it's goddamn impossible to use, really there was nothing we could do about it. Um, and of course, we ended up being stuck with a monster. So our, our fix there, our, our solution really was to, to kind of revisit what we were doing. And we really kind of had to admit, like, maybe we're not as good at this as we think we are. So we, we actually took, some, took this framework, we kind of chucked it to the side, and we looked at getting more off-the-shelf tools. And the big thing that we changed in order to be more successful with these off-the-shelf tools is that we really revised our approach. So rather than us trying to bend a tool to work with our existing workflow that we'd done for the last five years, we changed our mindset so that we could really program into the tool and figure out how, how something like, say, a Spinnaker wants us to work and, and really leverage kind of that tool's power. Cool. So those are some of the things that we did not do so well or we had to uh, rethink as we were going along. We did get a couple of things right the first time. Not very many, but uh, maybe, we, maybe they're worthy of mention. And uh, if you're uh, going along on this journey as well, that uh, you can learn from. So uh, first thing is, as I mentioned, the, uh, the team's got a whole lot more to do. So um, features and bugs, uh, that's the usual bread and butter of a development team, but adding the on-call responsibilities, uh, adding uh, capacity planning and budget maintenance uh, might not be that exciting to a dev team, and also uh, maintenance of service level objectives. So I'm going to talk a bit more in detail about that in a minute. Um, but really what this was all about was trading off for more autonomy. So in addition to um, those additional responsibilities, uh, teams uh, got more autonomy to live their own lives, to uh, be the master of their own destinies. So uh, first of all, something that's actually always been part of X Matters culture is that uh, the team is the ultimate arbitrator of personnel. Uh, team leads have hire and fire responsibilities. And uh, they, are, they are constantly making sure that the right people are on the bus, maybe the wrong people are off the bus. Uh, teams also uh, dictate their sprint commitments. So uh, there's a part of X Matters culture is not having product management overly uh, pressure the dev teams to be able to uh, you know, do more, deliver more features, et cetera. Um, dev teams know best uh, how much they can get done in a particular sprint. And uh, that, that is their choice. What's uh, very important, especially with regards to uh, SEV 1s in the middle of the night, is that teams are given time to uh, fix those issues. And I'll talk a bit more about the mechanism of that in a minute. Um, very important part is design and architecture. Of course, X Matters has architects. We have um, software architects, cloud architects, uh, test architects. But it's the teams, they're there to provide, uh, to promote consistency and provide guidance if the team wants it. Uh, but the team itself gets to decide you know, what particular architecture they would like to pursue or what tools they want to use. Um, because after all, they're the ones on the hook for making sure the service is up and running 24-7. And uh, as I mentioned before, the distribution of on-call comp, on-call compensation, uh, is team business in the X Matters model. One other nice win that we got right out of the gate is we had a system in place leading up to this whereby every single one of our teams had 10% of their sprint allocated to work on whatever technical debt they felt was most pressing. The goal here was to really have something that was bottom up and so that if people had you know, some kind of issues they felt really needed attention, they didn't need to negotiate that immediately with PM. So using that program, we saw some great successes. You know, we've seen some new tooling be implemented. Uh, we've seen folks go in and, and implement you know, developer tools that make life easier for everybody. And generally, we've, we've seen this kind of be used to kind of sand off a few of those rough edges and, and really nullify some pain points. 
But the really, really nice thing about this program is that it meant that when we told teams that we would give them the autonomy to, to function on their service and, and to actually fix the things they felt in need of fixing, they believed that we, we meant what we said. So another thing we got right was involving product management very early in the process. So um, as engineers, you know, we're very keen to uh, build the best mousetrap we can um, and make sure that our infrastructure is super solid so we don't get woken up in the middle of the night. But the fact is that all of these things uh, take away from your feature velocity. So you have to have a clear agreement at the outset how much we're going to invest in a particular effort like this, both on the, on the project side and on the ongoing maintenance side. And one thing that we found extremely useful is taking a page out of the, uh, the Google SRE book and implementing uh, service level objectives and service level indicators very early on as we were um, carving out these microservices. So uh, if you're not familiar with these, they are similar to uh, service level agreements that you would have with customers. But this is more a contract between product management and engineering. So in practice, what that means is that it's, it's pre-negotiated that um, you know, if you do not meet a particular service level objective, that you spend effort on infrastructure. Um, and Conversely, if you do meet your service level objective, you keep innovating, taking risks, and providing a great product. So what this looks like in practice is um, something like this. So this is a dashboard, maybe not the best dashboard, of one of our services that uh, has an SLO around latency. So in particular, for a 10-minute average, we're looking to make sure that we keep our latency under uh, 800 milliseconds on average. Sorry, my mic is kind of falling off here. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, so what we see here is that the green line, the service level indicator, is uh, staying under that red line. We continue to push features. We continue to innovate, provide a great uh, user experience for our customer. Should that go over the threshold uh, that we have pre-agreed, it's a tools down scenario. We're going to go and invest in infrastructure. Maybe that means go fix some bugs. Maybe it means um, you know, re-architect that particular service. It really depends on a case-by-case -case basis. But the key here is that this has been pre-negotiated uh, with product management. There's, it really reduces organizational conflict in how much you invest in the, these types of non-functional requirements. And finally, we, we did have one thing that, that really worked well for us. So if you're not familiar with XMatters, we've been, we've been operating a while in kind of the incident management, uh, IT notification space. So we had a, a lot of built-in expertise already uh, that we were able to leverage. And of course, you know, the, the other really nice thing is that, you know, we have a, a pretty good conduit to deal with our, our product managers if we need additional features. So this meant, you know, also not only can we ask for things that we want, it meant that since our developers were using the product, they could really very quickly, if they identified an issue, get a fix into the product or get some time to work on, on the thing that they are experiencing and likely our customers are also experiencing. The other really nice advantage to what XMatters gave, gave us is that uh, a lot of dev teams like to build you know, different tools. They, they may be like one monitoring tool versus another, and really XMatters exists to facilitate that so that these tools can all, all integrate with one another, and we can have a seamless kind of motion between everything. So uh, I, I think with that, we'll, uh, we'll wrap up. Um, this is kind of an ongoing journey for us. We're, we're certainly far from complete, and, and we do operate in an agile environment like a lot of you, so we are, are continuously in, uh, iterating as we discover problems with this approach. So thank you very much for your time, and uh, I'm not sure if we have any time for questions. Oh, we do have time for questions. If any of you have a softball question you would like to lob at us, please feel free. Um, I have no idea how the AV works, so I will say just talk loudly. Uh, you, sir. Sure. So the, the question is, uh, what, what is the scale that we're currently operating on? Like, what are the scale of our microservices? And um, I don't know if you've got those numbers handy. Uh, what sort of, uh, what are you looking for? Like, memory or w whatever our particular transactions? Okay. Okay, sure. So uh, just general level of scale. Uh, 
I think the best way to express it in our infrastructure is millions of notifications or millions of events that we're processing per day uh, in six regions uh, around the world. A uh, number of teams, development teams is 13. A number of, uh, and number of developers per team or the number of team members is roughly between five and eight. So that's, that's about where we're at. Is that good? Yeah, yeah okay, cool. Talking about this transition and then Right, right. Okay, so uh, the first question, the timeline for this change, it, it's sort of been a continuous process for the past two years. Okay. That's roughly, roughly the timeline. And as for the SLOs, um, this it's really team business how they implement these um, and and this is kind of a simple one um, generally speaking we work in percentiles to avoid you know missing like very small spikes that might fit between uh, between instances of measuring so uh, I couldn't say that we have like a, a standard around that although as we learn what works and what what doesn't work then obviously we'll converge towards the standard but yeah Really, at this point, it's team business, and uh, it really does vary from microservice to microservice how these how these are created and what works best. So, uh, okay, this sorry, this gentleman's got the mic. We'll come to you next. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So. How do you expose these type of metrics to the rest of the Eng team? And is that something people look at when they're, you know, kind of continuing to build off of these platforms? Yeah, so uh, the, the question is how we expose uh, this type of information to the rest of the engineering team. So for us, uh, we have everything being served up by a central Grafana instance. Uh, the, the main source of our metrics for, for dashboards like this is Prometheus. Uh, so really, any team kind of has at a glance. They can look at anyone else's dashboard, see what they're up to. Um, we do track the, the hard, the codified uh, SLOs that have been agreed upon. Those are all tracked in our internal documentation tools. Um, and uh, also, you know, we have uh, heads-up displays for every service team area. So anybody who's just walking by can, you know, take a look and see kind of what the overall health is. Uh, over here. Oh, you got the microphone, so you're the boss here. So the, the question is, what was the biggest cultural change that, that we saw? Um, I, I know for myself, uh, the answer that I, I would say is uh, we had a lot of people who were really reluctant to get on board with this. Um, but once they started actually doing it, uh, then they saw, hey, you know, this isn't quite so bad. And, you know, you, you kind of build that investment by people, you know, having to deal with this day in, day out. Uh, it looks very daunting to start with, but if you gradually ramp up, then it's significantly easier. Yeah, uh, I would agree with that. And providing information on call-out rates in advance um, and making sure you're tracking those so that you can look someone in the eye and say, listen, you're going to go on this on-call uh, rotation, but really you're going to get called like three, four times a year. You know? So that, that doesn't sound so bad, whereas you know, it just without that information, you're like, I'm going to be up all the time. You know? So yeah, that, that helped a lot. So there are good cost estimation tools, uh, and we found them to be surprisingly accurate, either because they are surprisingly accurate or dev teams figured out a way to put it in a budget. I'm not quite sure uh, which is closer to the truth, but um, cost-wise, uh, we were able to predict fairly accurately. We don't have a, 
like a wide variety of technology stacks for these microservices. Most of these uh, microservices come from the original monolithic code base, and they use the same technologies that that code base did. So it was fairly easy to extrapolate uh, what would be required in that way. For those other services uh, that were sort of oddball services, uh, those obviously had to be tested specifically. And for all of the services, we did uh, extensive testing in terms of load testing, soak testing, uh, break testing. And yeah, generally speaking, what we found was uh, moving from the co-location hardware into uh, someone else's hardware, uh, we, we had gains in, in performance and, and so on. So it wasn't, wasn't a huge worry in that, in that way. There's, there's one question in the very back there. Oh, oh, we had lots of change in the code base. I, I must have misspoke if that's what you heard. Um, yeah, I mean, the technology stack stayed the same, but there, uh, a lot of these services had to be made uh, multi-tenant, which necessitated a huge amount of change in terms of their communication with one another and their internal processing, scheduling. The, it was a major re-architecture of the entire product in the end. Yeah. I don't know, everything changed, so. <laughs> the, yeah, uh, in, I can say that the, the cultural changes were equally difficult to the, to the, you know, the technology, uh, but there are plenty of challenges in both areas. There's, uh, there's also some significant you know, technical challenges. When you, when you move to something that's distributed, it really did take a little bit of time for our devs to kind of get on board with that. You know, if you're used to calling a library that exists in memory on the exact same machine, you just call it. Uh, but if you're dealing with something that is now going over a network link and, and maybe has different uptime agreements, you know, you really have to do a lot more defensive programming that way, which I think took a little bit for people to get. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.